This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. On a few occasions I have seen in my comment sections people querying the Scottish response to the imprisonment of Mary Queen of Scots in England and also how her subsequent execution was handled. How did James VI of Scots deal with his neighbouring monarch and kinswoman, both while she was holding his mother in captivity and after she had signed that death warrant that would lead to Mary's execution? How much was his response guided by the fact that he wanted to be Elizabeth's heir? Well, today we're going to take a look at this and by looking at the extant evidence we will hopefully gain a better understanding of this complicated and highly emotive situation. But before we jump into today's topic I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring another video on this channel. When it comes to building, updating and managing my website Squarespace has really made all the difference. Their Fluid Engine website design system offers a massive variety of website templates, all of which are super easy to customise in every way. It's literally just drag and drop. For even more convenience, you can edit your website not only on your desktop, but also on your phone. I can also use Squarespace to keep an eye on my website traffic through a whole bunch of useful analytics tools. Above all, it's been really helpful to keep an eye on all of the emails that I've been sending out to my mailing list. I can make sure that they've all reached their intended destination, but I can also see if or indeed when they've been opened and what links in them are being clicked. So if you have signed up to receive emails from me, but you haven't seen them yet, please have a little check to make sure they haven't been caught up in your spam filter. To build, launch and manage your own website, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then, when you are ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash reading the past to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. But now, it's time to take a look at both Royal Anglo-Scottish relations in the latter half of the 16th century and also the relationship between James VI and his mother Mary. When little James Stuart was born at Edinburgh Castle on the 19th of June 1566, his parents' marriage was, it would turn out, already irreversibly strained. Three months before James's birth, his father, Henry Stuart Lord Darnley, had been involved in the murder of his mother, Mary Queen of Scots's favourite, David Rizzio. It was a brutal event that happened in front of the heavily pregnant Queen. When the baby was baptised at Stirling Castle on the 17th of December 1566, his father refused to attend. Less than two months later, as the 9th became the 10th of February 1567, Lord Darnley was murdered at Kirker Field. James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, was believed by many to be responsible for Darnley's death. On the 15th of May 1567, it was Bothwell that Mary married. Little James had last seen his mother on the 21st of April, and at that point, he was just under two months shy of his first birthday. This Bothwell marriage generated a groundswell of opposition on the part of Mary's lords, so much so that by the 15th of June 1567, which was four days before James's first birthday, Mary found herself left with no choice but to surrender to her enemies. And then the following day, the 16th of June, she was imprisoned in Lochleven Castle. Mary's queenship officially came to an end on the 24th of July 1567, when she, under duress, signed deeds of abdication. Her son, now aged 13 months, was from that moment King of Scots. He was crowned at Stirling five days later on the 29th of July. Mary escaped from Loch Leven on the 2nd of May 1568, and before long she felt that she had no other option than to leave Scotland for refuge in England. She would arrive there on the 16th of May. 
Mary would never return to Scotland again. And so that 21st of April visit, which I mentioned a few moments ago, would prove to be the very last time that James would see his mother in person. And considering that he was not yet one at that time, I think it's fair to assume that James would have no real memory of her, that anything he knew about his mother would have to, presumably, be based upon the reports of others. Or at least it would, until he was old enough to correspond with her himself on his own behalf. Even then, though, we may wish to consider how easy it would be for parental bonds to be both fostered and supported only through letters. Letters that both parties would have known, or at least assumed, were being read by others. We might wonder who could have been shaping James's opinion of his mother from his earliest years. Perhaps his regents might have guided his thinking, or at least the ones that survive long enough. His mother's half-brother, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, was assassinated in January 1570. His paternal grandfather, Matthew Stuart, Earl of Lennox, was killed in September 1571, and then John Erskine, Earl of Mar, died in October 1572, officially of natural causes, although rumours of poison did abound. These men had been part of removing and or keeping Mary from power. Might this have impacted the way they talked about her to her son, if indeed they talked about her at all? I mean, in the case of Lennox, I think he might have had very particular feelings about the woman that he deemed to be at least complicit in the murder of his son. In any case, all three of these regents would be dead by the time that James was six. And so we might question how much anyone's going to be talking about an absent mother to a fatherless boy of this tender age. James's last regent was James Douglas, Earl of Morton, and he had switched his allegiance numerous times, from Mary to Darnley to Bothwell, to those who sought to bring Bothwell and Mary down. With this in mind, what might he have told James about his mother? Morton was unseated in a March 1578 coup that had the nearly 12-year-old James as its figurehead, and at this point, James announced his capacity and intention to rule for himself. Another influence on James's view of his mother may perhaps be found in the religious services that James attended. These were those of the Presbyterian Scottish Kirk, whose preachers were, for the most part, theologically inspired by Calvin. As James's reign went on, he would have to confront and contend with the particularly ardent members of his clergy. When James sought to assert his authority over the Kirk, there were those who were prepared to counter his claims in the strongest terms, because to them, he was a member of the Kirk like any other person. It was not for him to lead, but to follow. And I do wonder if James's mother's Roman Catholic faith might have been something that further distanced him from her. Might he have come to view her as another opponent for him to face in matters of faith? There were, however, others who would have had more than a little input on James's thinking during his childhood and adolescence, namely his tutors. Jenny Warmold explains that, quote, The choice of his principal tutor, appointed when he was four, was obvious. George Buchanan, noted European humanist, exponent of resistance theory and slanderer of his mother to which attributes could be added a fair degree of sadism. Beating the Lord's anointed was not just a matter of discipline, but of satisfaction. At the end of his life, the king still had nightmares about Buchanan, although by that time, with Buchanan long dead, he could also express pride in having a tutor of great academic distinction, as he did when complimented by an English courtier on his pronunciation of Latin and Greek. I do wonder what effect this tutor, who James was apparently both terrified of and ultimately grateful for, who was so open in his distaste for Mary Queen of Scots, what effect would he have had on James's view of his mother? In the early 1580s, there were suggestions, apparently devised and promoted by Mary herself, that she and James might enter into some kind of joint rule together over Scotland. She had hoped this plan would buy her liberty, 
so she could either return to Scotland and to at least nominal power, or even that she could remain in England, but no longer as a prisoner. By this point, however, James was in his late teens, and he had, until this point, been principally concerned with making good on his previous claims of being both willing and able to rule for himself. And so perhaps this suggestion of his mother's was unappealing to him, because it would require James to share power. Perhaps he was unwilling to help the woman he had been told had murdered his father. Or maybe it was simply the case that the political and diplomatic capital that James would have to expend to bring this plan to pass was simply too high a cost for him to pay. Instead, James and Elizabeth I came to their own terms. They shared an affectionate correspondence where she referred to him variously as her dear brother and cousin, while he would call her his dearest sister, cousin and mother. James would express the expected affection for his actual mother, but it seems that this affection did not extend to making a deal that might secure her liberty and thus her security. There is, however, evidence of James discussing the plans of certain foreign agents working on his mother's behalf and thus against Elizabeth. But it appears that he went no further than talk. No sign of him offering either verbal, physical or fiscal support for any of these plots has been detected. If the later evidence is to be believed, Mary was not content to leave off her attempts to obtain her liberty nor was she content to only focus on one plan. If James and joint rule were not going to be her route, then seemingly she would look to find another, whether that meant coming to terms with Philip of Spain in a manner that would disinherit her son James from any claim to the English throne, or whether it was going to be by finding co-conspirators who were much closer to hand. In 1586, that would be Anthony Babington and his confederates. I have got a video on the Babington plot, which I will leave linked. Suffice to say, the evidence connected to and generated by this plot would show that Mary Queen of Scots endorsed it and also added her own recommendations to bring it to pass. Mary was accused of treason. She was tried and convicted. All that remained was for Elizabeth to sign the warrant for her execution. On the 26th of January, 1587, James wrote to Elizabeth, begging her to spare his mother's life. When we take a look at this letter, on first glance, it appears panicked, desperate. There's even an implied threat level within it. But look again and see that while there is panic, desperation, even threat implied, it never steps over the line. James never breaks protocol. He does not actively threaten Elizabeth. His panic, his desperation, do not make him lose control. Among other things, he states, quote, Yet justly preferring the duty of an honest friend to the sudden passions of one who, how soon they be passed, can wisely away the reasons than I can set them down, I have resolved in a few words and plan to give you my friendly and best advice, appealing to your ripest judgment to discern thereupon. What thing, madam, can greatly attach me in honour that is a king and a son than that my nearest neighbour, being in straightest friendship with me, shall rigorously put to death a free sovereign prince and my natural mother, alike in estate and sex to her that so uses her, albeit subject, I grant, to a harder fortune, and touching her nearly in proximity of blood? What law of God can permit that justice shall strike upon them whom he has appointed supreme dispensators of the same under him, whom he hath called gods, and therefore subjected to the censure of none in earth, whose anointing by God cannot be defiled by man, unrevenged by the author thereof, who being supreme and immediate lieutenants of God in heaven, cannot therefore be judged by their equals in earth. What monstrous thing is it that sovereign princes themselves should be the example givers of their own sacred diadems profaning? Then what should move you to this form of proceeding? Supposing the worst, which in good faith I look not for at your hands, honour or profit? Honour were it to you to spare when it is least looked for. 
Honour were it to you, which is not only my friendly advice, but my earnest suit, to take me and all other princes in Europe, eternally beholden unto you in granting this, my so reasonable request, and not, pardon I pray you, my free speaking, to put princes to straits of honour, where through your general reputation and the universal almost misliking of you, may dangerously peril both in honour and utility your person and estate. Ye know, madam, well enough, how small difference Cicero concludes to be betwixt util, utility, and honestum, honour, in his disclosure thereof, and which of them ought to be framed to the other. And now, madam, to conclude, I pray you so to weigh their few arguments, that as I ever presumed of your nature, so the whole world may praise your subjects for their dutiful care for your preservation, and yourself for your princely pity, the doing whereof only belongs unto you, the performing whereof only appertains unto you, the praise thereof only ever will be yours. What is thought to be Elizabeth's response to this is found in an undated letter. She writes to James, quote, You may see whether I keep the serpent that poisons me when they confess to have reward. By saving of her life, they would have had mine. Do I not think you make myself a goodly prey for every wretch to devour? Transfigure yourself into my state and suppose what you ought to do and thereafter weigh my life, and reject the care of murder, and shun all baits that may untie our amities, and let all men know that princes know best their own laws, and misjudge not that you know not. Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed at Fotheringay on the 8th of February, 1587. On the 14th of February, Elizabeth wrote to James, quote, My dear brother, I would you knew though not felt, the extreme dolor that overwhelms my mind, for that miserable accident which, far contrary to my meaning, hath befallen. I have now sent this kinsman of mine, whom ere now it hath pleased you to favour, to instruct you truly of that which is too irksome for my pen to tell you. I beseech you that, as God and many more know, how innocent I am in this case. So you will believe me that if I had bid aught, I would have bid by it. I am not so base-minded that fear of any living creature or prince should make me so afraid to do that were just, or done to deny the same. I am not of so base a lineage, nor carry so vile a mind. But as not to disguise fits not a king, so will I never dissemble my actions, but cause them show, even as I meant them. Thus assuring yourself of me that as I know this was deserved, yet, if I had meant it, I would never lay it on other shoulders. No more will I not damnify myself that thought it not. The circumstance it may please you to have of this bearer, and for your part, think you have not in the world a more loving kinswoman, nor a more dear friend than myself, nor any that will watch more carefully to preserve you and your estate. And who shall otherwise persuade you? Judge them more partial to others than you. And thus, in haste, I leave to trouble you, beseeching God to send you a long reign. The 14th of February, 1587. Your most assured, loving sister and cousin, Elizabeth R. The following month, James replied to Elizabeth with, quote, Madam and dearest sister, Whereas by your letter ye purge yourself of your unhappy fact, together with your many and solemn attestations of your innocency, I dare not wrong you so far as not to judge honourably of your unspotted part therein. So on the other side, I wish that your honourable behaviour in all other times hereafter may fully persuade the whole world of the same. And as for my part, I look that ye will give me at this time such a full satisfaction in all respects as shall be a mean to strengthen and unite this isle, establish and maintain the true religion, and to oblige me to be as of before I was, your most loving. He omits that last word. Was it going to be son, brother, cousin, friend? Is this perhaps a sign 
of James's distraction at the loss of his mother? Or could this omission have been more calculated? Designed to inspire Elizabeth to go further to make amends to him, perhaps by naming him unquestionably as the heir to her throne. Was James willing to take no action in his mother's name in the hope that England would one day be his? After all, James did spend much of the remainder of Elizabeth's reign seeking recognition for this claim of his. This recognition was not forthcoming, but neither was any clear refusal of the same. And when Elizabeth died on the 24th of March 1603, it would be James who acceded to the English throne. In 1606, the elaborate monument that James commissioned for Elizabeth was completed. It was placed in the north aisle of the Henry VII Lady Chapel at Westminster Abbey. She was interred beneath it in a vault with her half-sister Mary. In 1612, the monument for Mary Queen of Scots, which was taller than that which had been produced for Elizabeth, was also ready. Mary was moved from Peterborough Cathedral and was reinterred beneath this new monument, which sits in the south aisle of the Lady Chapel, so opposite to Elizabeth's tomb. The wording on Mary Queen of Scots' tomb is by Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, and it announces, among other things, that she was the, quote, sole heir and great-granddaughter of Henry VII, King of England, through his elder daughter, Margaret, that she was, quote, Mistress of Scotland by law, of France by marriage, of England by expectation, thus blessed by a threefold right with a threefold crown, that she was, quote, great in marriage, greater still in lineage, greatest of all in her progeny. Here lies buried the daughter, bride and mother of kings. God grant that her sons, and all who are descended from her may hereafter behold the cloudless days of eternity. So what do you think of James's relationship with or his feelings about his mother? Do you think he blamed her for his father's death and so chose not to help her when he could? Did he want to avoid a situation where he had to share his rule, his power with her? Or to defer to her claim to the English throne as one that might supersede his own? Was he simply more concerned with obtaining the greater prize of the English crown? Was he desperate to avoid the danger that might be generated by supporting her fulsomely? Is it possible that this king, who as a very small boy had learned that his regents had been killed, who experienced threats against his own life, who was berated by his priests and beaten by his tutor, was driven principally by a desire to survive? Or was it, do you think, something else entirely that motivated him? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. But I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement. And the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube shares it out, which will help us to grow our community. I'm a bit torn as to what emoji to suggest. I wonder whether you want to pick... James, Elizabeth and Mary emojis. What ones do you think connect most to them? You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the place you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends and if you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, do have a check now just to make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way YouTube claims that they will tell you when I've next uploaded and also when I'm next going live, which I do to talk about the history news. And I know you're not going to want to miss that. We have got our fail safe. Head over to my website www.katrinamarchant.com and as you can see when you're there head to the contact page and then in the box on the contact page pop your email address in there that will add you to my mailing list and I will send you out an email once a week to let you know what I'm up to and to also send you any useful links that you might need for the rest of that week. 
I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.